God bless you for those of you that are tuned in with us by way of Rumble tonight on this beautiful rainy evening and afternoon here in our county. And God bless you and thanks for tuning in. Uh, may the Lord bless you and you can download the link there and get the study load guide and click on it and it'll download the study guide for you tonight. But thanks for joining with us. We're studying the book of Ephesians right now. We've been in it since January 1st and uh, we're moving right along in chapter 4 now as we're getting into the second half of the book, the second division of the book on putting the application to the doctrine and, and all the riches and wealth that we have in Christ in chapters 1, 2, and 3. And Paul comes along now, and, uh, and here's that dividing uh, point, the division, the, the, the hinge where the book uh, moves in a different direction here in, in our how we're living and holy living in an unholy world. And uh, we started out with chapter 4 after we came off those wonderful three chapters there on how to act in church. And all of you were surprised with what we looked at that on how to act in church. And verse 3 gives us the key verse there that we are to uh, endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace as we're how to act in the church. And then we looked at as we moved on verses 4, 7 through 16, uh, we went to the gym and did some bodybuilding and uh, how to build the body, the body of Christ, and looking at that. And then... Uh, this week we're going to be looking at how to dress for success. So first we learn how to walk uh, with other Christians and other believers in the church, and that is to maintain unity. And then this evening we're going to look on how to dress for success, and that is spiritually uh, for your own life and how we're doing that. So we're going to look at that as we begin in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 24 tonight. So that's where our text will be at, and we'll begin there in verse 17. But Father, we ask you now to bless our time in your word. Thank you for your word. We always thank you for your word, God. It's so great to have it, and what a privilege it is to read it, to study it, to hold it, to meditate upon it, to memorize it. Father, thank you for giving it to us. Lord, I don't know how we could live without it, I don't know how we can go a day without it in our lives. And so we thank you for this wonderful word called the Bible, the Word of God. And we just want to praise you for it. Ask for your help now that your Holy Spirit will now come and be our teacher and our guide as he will guide us into all truth. 
Uh, he will give us the illumination, understanding of the Scripture. We ask for wisdom on how to apply it. And so, Father, may we take what we learn tonight and apply it in our lives when it comes to spiritual dress. And so, Lord, we pray we would learn something and then use it uh, for your honor, for your glory, uh, to live and walk for you. And, Father, we'll thank you for it and ask that you would anoint your word. As always, the Holy Spirit, we ask for your anointing upon your servant in this hour. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well... Someone asked a question, are your clothes important to God? Your clothes. Or does God really care what you wear? Before you answer no too quickly, we'll, we'll talk about it in just a minute. There was a Christian uh, uh, psychologist or Christian writer, philosopher, Ramses in the 1500s, and he coined the phrase, clothes make the man. So clothe yourself the best you can, he says. And so, and I think Paul would highly agree with him if he would have been around and writing was Paul's there. And so, but Paul is talking about our spiritual clothes and the behavior that we put on to display every day for our lives. And so we're talking about spiritual clothing, not physical clothing. But if someone was to ask you, does God care about your clothes? Does God care what you wear? Well, yes, he does, because he cares about you, you see. And our outward clothing, we are a representation of, first of all, the Lord Jesus Christ. We represent him, first and foremost, even in our outward appearance. And then we represent the church as a body of believers, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ. And then it's for your own testimony that you have of the Lord. So yes, it is important, but we're not going to talk about outward clothing tonight. We're going to talk about spiritual clothing and as to how we're to walk. So notice with me as we begin, I think the first thing we want to look at is uh, how we're going to dress for success in spiritual clothing. We find right off the bat here in verses 17 through 19, and that is, uh, number one, I believe, the mandate for purity. The mandate for purity. And we see here, Paul takes the whole last half of chapter 4 uh, to talk about this mandate for purity in our lives and so forth. So he first talked to us about this, and we're going to take a look at it. And we first of all, we see the command right here in verse number 17. The believer is not to walk or to live as Gentiles do, that is, as ungodly men. And that we're not to walk as the Gentiles. Look what he says in verse 17. This I say, therefore... And testify in the Lord. So in other words, he got this from the Lord. So he's testifying in the Lord. So this came from the Lord. That ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Or literally the emptiness of their mind. Now there was two different Greek words used for the word Gentiles. And one's used in another way. Here's another use of the word here that he's using here. In this, and the vanity there means the emptiness of one's mind. And he tells us here that, that as a believer, we're not to walk or live here as the Gentiles do. That is, those Gentiles that are ungodly men with empty minds. In vanity, and then so someone says, so we see that. And then he tells us that in verses 18 and 19, as we'll get into that a little bit. So that one didn't take much along for you, except here we look, look at the contrast. Now he talks about these gen other Gentiles and how we're not to walk after and walk like and live like. And he says that here in verses 18 and 19. Here he goes. Having the understanding darkened, that is, these Gentiles that he's talking about here in verse 17, having their understanding, understanding is darkened darkened there's the first thing number one number two they're being alienated from the life of God uh, t second thirdly through the ignorance uh, that's in them and it's because of the blindness of their heart I mean he's taught this he's given the contrast of these men verse 19 is a good key one here who being past feeling have given themselves over now this is he's talking about these Gentiles in the past and we're going to bring that out here a little bit to you in a minute and the past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to, to work all uncleanness with greediness. 
So Paul's describing these other Gentiles here and telling us that we're not to, if we're going to walk spiritually for the Lord and be clothed in spiritual clothing, we're not to walk uh, as this, and there's a mandate for purity in our lives. And so someone might be thinking and saying, well, man, how, how did, and when you read verses 18 and 19 and you take a look at that slowly and go through it, you might think to yourself, how, how, do, how do they think so low, okay, in their lives? How do people think so low in their lives? Look what he says. He, said they, they, he, he says their, their understanding is darkened. They're alienated from the life of God. They're ignorant uh, that's in them. They're ignorant and they're, they're blinded of their hearts. That means they got a hard heart. That's what that's talking about. And, and in their past, their feeling, they've given themselves over. That ought to be key to tell you where we're going. Under lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. And so someone would say, how does someone sink that low? And someone would say, man, wouldn't it be nice if they would just knew the truth? If they just knew the truth, they might live and walk differently? I mean, wouldn't you think that? Amen? Well, I got some good news for you. They did know the truth. Let's go back to Romans chapter 1. Okay? We were there on a Sunday night a few weeks ago. But let's go back. Paul's talking about this very group right here. In Romans chapter 1, everybody back to Romans chapter 1. All right, let's take a look at it here. He's talking about here, Romans chapter 1, and we'll take a look at it in your outline here. So we're taking along to help you as well, because he talks about somebody would say, man, wouldn't, wouldn't they simply, you would think that why would they sink so low with their lives? And, and if only if, if they knew the truth, they would perhaps not live and do that way. But guess what? They did know the truth. Okay, first of all, I want you to know every unbeliever, church, every unbeliever has received the truth. Look with me in Romans chapter 1. Everybody in Romans chapter 1. All right, verse number 18. Let's begin. Let's take a look at it. Verse number 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Well, you can't hold something if you don't have it. Okay? They're subject to God's wrath because they're ungodly and wicked, and they suppress the truth of God. Verse 19, he says, because that which, that which may be known of God is manifested in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So when Paul says we're not to walk as other Gentiles, he's referring to these Gentiles here and how they're walking. And if you recall, a while back, Paul also wrote to this group and said, hey, he began saying that these that do these things and do such things, and he lists us all those things, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But I love what he says next. But such were some of you. But thank God you're washed in the blood. So you see, you can be saved even if you're in person. But here we find these people had received the truth. I mean, they had given, the truth was given to them. They were subjects of God's wrath because they were ungodly and wicked. They, they suppressed the truth of God. And, and then we see uh, not only that, not only did they receive the truth, they rejected the truth. See, so if you were to say, man, you'd think when you read Ephesians 4, 18 and 19, you'd say, wow, I mean, uh, surely how do people sink so low? How did these Gentiles sink so low here in Romans? Is because uh, if they only knew the truth, folks, they knew the truth. God revealed the truth to them. They had received the truth of God's word in verses 18 through 20 in Romans. And then they turned around in verses 21 and 22. They rejected the truth. Look at verse 21 and 22. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. That's what we just read about, the darkness of their heart. Okay, Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. So we see in tw verse 21 there, he said that they, they, these were men that did not honor God or give him thanks. 
as a result, they're mad empty. Their hearts are darkened, which we just read in Ephesians here. He said the blindness of their hearts in verse 18 of Ephesians 4 there, as we see there. And, and so we, we see this act here in verse 22. Uh, these men became prideful and they turned away from God. And so they rejected the truth. Now, church, when you reject the truth, you're going to replace it with something else. When a people or a nation reject God, and there's that void and emptiness there, they're going to replace God with something or someone else. And that's exactly what America has done today. Our country has replaced God with something else or someone else. And we, you can say a lot of things what we've replaced him with, but America has turned their back on God. We no longer recognize him. We know the truth. We've received the truth, but we've rejected the truth. Easter Sunday is supposed to be the most sacred Sunday in all the year. It's the highest attendance of Sunday in any other one. The second highest is Christmas. You know what the third highest is? Mother's Day. You know what the fourth is? Father's Day. Fathers, we come behind the mothers. But this country is turning away from God. Already have. Woe to a nation that forgets God. Sin is approach to any people, but righteousness exalteth the nation. And we have turned our backs on God, because for the first time in the history of this country, this past weekend on Eastern, the United States of America, the government, our leaders, our government, our leaders in Washington, declared that we would not recognize nor worship the Easter of Sunday of the resurrection, and it would now become a holiday of the group we just read about in Romans chapter 1. And we have replaced it with the god of the, ro of the old Babylonian pagan god, the goddess, the sex goddess of that generation, of that kind of folks. What's the name of that god? No. This is old, this is old Babylonian. Ish what? Ishtak, yeah. Ishtak, the god of the old Babylonian pagan. It was a... Starts with a T. Can't even speak anymore. We can't exercise the First Amendment of my right. She was the god of the T's, which is being pushed and promoted today. Half male, half female. And could be whatever she wanted to be whatever day and promote it. And you go and study that and you can read it. I'll tell you a book to want to get. You want to know. It's totally, it's documented. It's factual truth. And that is the gods have returned. And the men even back in those days would take and do things to their body, parade around and jump around like females, and the females with the men. I'm telling you. And, he said, and our president declared that Sunday there would be no, any type of religious Symbols or anything done or won, but it would be this would be a national holiday and we would advertise and promote their colors to promote their gender and so forth and everything that's going on. America has turned their back on God. And God, I believe, is about to write Ichabod over America and look out for the judgment that's coming. Go read it. Study it. It's exactly what happened Sunday. You're the first time in the history of this country we didn't recognize Sunday as the day of resurrection of our Lord. We're in deep trouble. Oh, we've received the truth. We've rejected the truth. And you can go out there and look up the newsreels and you can see it and you can hear it. It's all out there, okay? I was going to not say that tonight. But I can't help it. I was going to say it's Sunday. But I didn't want us going out of here on a sad note. On our resurrection Sunday of our Lord. Thinking about that garbage. What a sad day in America. And that's what America has replaced God with that.
verse 23 of Romans, look at it. They replaced God with another God of their liking to what or whoever they want it to be. Romans 1.23 says, And they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. In other words, they do what they want. And when you do this, let me tell you what happens. You want to know what happens when you do that? Let's stay in Romans chapter 1 and read it. So we already covered this on a Sunday night, so we're not going to stay here long. Romans chapter 1, verse 24 and 20 through 28. Wherefore, because God also gave them up to uncleanness. We read that in our book right here, in, 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 uh, in Ephesians here, okay, lasciviousness and all kinds of stuff. Through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, who worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever, amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did exchange the natural use into that which is against nature, and likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, burned in their lust toward one another, men with men, working that which is unseemingly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of the air which was meet or fit. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. There's the judgment. And this is what we've done in America. Well, that's, and so that's why Paul said for us not to walk as other Gentiles, not to live as other Gentiles. There's a mandate for purity in the life of a believer, to live a pure life, a holy life, a consecrated life. And then he shows us in verses 18 and 19 here. We'll come back. Let's go back to our text in Ephesians now, if you don't mind. And that's where we'll stay for the rest of the evening here. Back to our text in verses 18 and 19. Once again, we see the downward spiral of unbelief. It starts off in verse 17 with the emptiness of mind. Then he comes to verse 18 and he says there are dark understanding. Then he says they're being separated from God. And, then, and why? Because they're, uh, they're uh, ignorant of God and because their hearts are hardened. That's what he's saying there in verse 18. He gives us the three reasons why. The, the downward spiral. See, it starts out with darkness. See, when you replace God, who, which is the light, you end up in the dark. And that's why the Bible says men love darkness rather than light. The Bible says the light came into the world and the world comprehended it not. And you can see the spiral decline of what takes place. So they would go from darkness. Then when you go to darkness and you're in the dark, now you're ignorant of God. Ignorance is what he said. That's being separated from God. They were ignorant of God. They were ignorant of the truth. Write down in your notes, 2 Timothy 3, 7. You can read that one later and figure that one out. And then they had to harden their hearts. See, that's what he talks about when he says the, the blindness of their hearts. You harden your heart. Folks, when you reject God and throw God out, you're going to be in the dark, and then you're going to be ignorant of God, and you're going to have a hard heart. And that's exactly what's happening in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, and verse 15, and then again in chapter 4 and verse 7, in those 13 verses, we have what we call the triplets, the triads, or triadics. God repeats the same phrase three times in 13 verses. And in other words, you're going to get the memo? He says, today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Three times. Then Jesus tells the churches of Revelation, if you got an ear, listen to what the Spirit has to say to the churches. Hardness of heart. You remember old Moses and Pharaoh? But if you go back to Exodus chapter 4 and verse 21, you'll find where God says, I hardened Pharaoh's heart. And then judged him for that. Somebody says, well, that's not fair. Man, you got to be kidding me. God hardened his heart. But may I remind you, before Exodus 4, 21, Pharaoh himself hardened his heart seven times. Pharaoh hardened his own heart seven times. Interesting, isn't it? Number seven, perfection. 
And so God says, I hardened his heart the last time he told Moses and will judge his heart. See, and somebody says, well, that's not fair. But remember, he seven times he hardened his heart sooner than that. You see, folks, and I don't know how far a person can go and harden their hearts. I don't know how far a person can go with all what we've just talked about. But I do know in Genesis 6, 3, God says that my spirit will not always strive with man's spirit. And there's coming a time that you'll, you'll listen and you'll hear the heart of God, you'll hear the truth of God, and you're going to reject it and reject it and reject it and reject it. And I don't know how long the line when the time comes, but you can cross God's deadline, my friend, and God says that's it. So then you see the spiral downfall of the sin of unbelief. And Paul admonishes us there's a mandate, there's a command for us as believers to live a pure life and to walk in purity. Not walk as these other heathens walk and wicked people and ungodly people. So somebody goes, man, this this is, I thought we were walking for success tonight. Well, you got to lay down the bad news first. Now we come to the good news. Somebody says, well, is there hope for all this? Yes. There's always hope in Jesus. Amen. Back to our text. Back to Ephesians chapter 20 now. I'm back to to chapter 4, verse 20. Let's get over to verse 20 20 here now. We're going to look at the last five verses here, 20 through 24. All right. The believer, in other words, when Paul says, but ye have not learned, you have not so learned Christ. In other words, the believer is to walk as Christ. And the reason why is because the believer has learned about Christ, and he's heard about Christ, and he's been taught about Christ. You know what he's talking about out there? Salvation. Because the, uh, the, the only way you and I can live a pure life and walk in purity, you've got to be saved. You've got to know the Lord. You've got to come to salvation. Ephesians 4.21 is talking about salvation here. How are we going to walk as Christ if we don't really know him? But we can and we can enjoy and having that salvation means we can have a pure life because we can come to Christ and walk in Christ and have salvation in Christ, everything in Him. Why? Because we've learned about Christ. How many of you have learned about Christ? Talking about a a relationship here, not a religion, but a relationship. How many have heard about Christ? See, they had heard about Christ through Paul, the Apostle Paul, and others. They had heard about him. Uh, they, they learned about him through Christ. And then as a result of it, salvation came to their hearts, to these believers here in Ephesians. And Paul says, now we need to walk worthy of that calling that we looked about in the beginning of the book here. Walk worthy of your vocation, of your calling. All right, everybody got that? Amen. That's what he says in verse 1 of chapter 4. Therefore, I am a prisoner of the Lord. Beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherein ye are called. And so we can only do that through salvation. And then the second thing, we have this wonderful truth. If we're going to walk in purity, it comes to sanctification. Okay, sanctification is a one-time act when you get saved. But then there's the process of sanctification as we live and walk for the Lord in purity. That's a daily walk. It's a daily thing. Sanctification. The way we're to walk in Christ. And then he gives us three ways we're to walk in Christ right here in this passage. All right, let's take a look at it. Verses 22 through 24. He gives us three ways we can walk in Christ. Everybody ready for it? Here we go, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22, because he just told us we need now that we've had salvation, now we need to get ready with the process of sanctification, and he says here's how we're to walk in Christ. And folks, we don't walk in Christ just the day we get saved, it's a lifetime ordeal. We're to be walking in Christ from the time we get saved to the time we go to glory. And then guess what, when you get in glory, guess what, you're still going to walk in Christ. Here it is, here's the first step, step number one. That you put off, that's an action verb here, concerning the former conversation, the old man. Conversation is your manner of living, your lifestyle. You're to put that off, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. So he said we're to put off the old man. Put off the old person. Put off the old self. The word put off there is that of a phrase of casting off something. It's like taking a garment and casting it off, Brother George, and throwing it off over here. Take the old man, take the old self, take the old person, and cast it off. Because that old person and old self is corrupt and deceitful lust. You can't walk in old life and walk with Christ if you're living in a corrupt life. 
She can't do it, okay? So he says, that's the first step he tells us to do. And you see, when you get through, start into the process of sanctification, that's what you're going to be doing, and it's a daily thing. Then notice the second thing he says to do, all right? And, and in order to walk in Christ, we got to cast off the old man, the old person, the old life that's corrupt with deceitful lust. And then the second thing he says there in verse 23, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. See, you and I are not going to be able to walk in Christ if we don't have a renewed mind. And we don't have the mind of the Spirit. A renewed there also has reference to, to a recommit. To recommit your mind. Now what does Romans 12, 1 and 2 say? I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God that what? You present your bodies what? A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. See, God wants a sacrifice, but He doesn't want a dead one. He wants a living one. And the living one has to be a holy one. And then in verse 2, he says, by the renewing of your mind. Let's take a look at it while we're there. Just back up to Romans. I don't want to misquote it. Sometimes I do. So I don't want to make sure. Go back to Romans chapter 12. All right, everybody, Romans chapter 12. We read the first one there. But verse 2, be not conformed to this world. See, you, you, if you don't throw off the old man, the old person, old person, you're going to be conformed to the world. So you're either going to be conformed to the world or you're going to be conformed to Christ. One or the other. But, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? So that you can show that God's will is good and it's acceptable and it's perfect. Now turn over to Philippians with me. After Galatians, Philippians. Everybody in Philippians chapter 2? Philippians chapter 2 with me. Everybody in Philippians 2? All right, here we go. Verse number 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. See, we're not going to have the mind of Christ until we throw off and cast off the old man. And the old person and the old self that's the, the corrupt and deceitful lust. You've got to have the mind of Christ. Well, how, are we gonna, how do I know how to have the mind of Christ? You've got to get in the book, folks. You want to know the mind of Christ, you need to get in the Bible. Here's the mind of Christ right here in the Bible. You want to know what Jesus thinks, what Jesus says, whatever else, it's in the book. So you see, first of all, you've got to throw off the old man that's corrupt and deceitful lust. Cast it off, throw it off, throw off the self, the old man. You see, now that you got salvation, now that you've been saved, now that you've been predestined, elected, chosen, and all that good stuff, and adopted and saved, God the Father called you, God the Son saved you, God the Holy Spirit sealed you, hallelujah. You have all this blessing and riches in Christ in chapter 1, now walk like it. Don't live and walk like the other Gentiles. Well, how do I do that? Throw off the old man. Cast them off, and then renew your mind. So you've got to have a recommitment of your mind, because before that, where was your mind? Your mind was in the deceitfulness of lust. The heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Amen? And, and, and everything, and it's corrupt, and so we've got to have a right mind. We've got to have a good mind if we're going to walk in Christ, and it's got to be a pure mind. can't be a filthy, dirty mind, Amen? So re- recommit your spirit and your mind to Christ. You see, then he tells you the third step. Either look at it. Now he says to put on. Are you with me now? Put on the new man. Well, I've cast off the old man and the old garment. What are we referring to in those days? They cast off the old garments. Now I'm going to put on the new man. Ah, all right, man. Now I got a new garment. All right, praise the Lord. Put on the new man, which after God is created now, look at the difference. Rather than corruption and incorruption and deceitful lust, look at here. The new man is what? He is created in righteousness and true holiness. So Paul tells us here, these wonderful passages of Scripture, he tells us here in verse 24 here as he closes it out, you know, let's go back now as we looked at just a little bit. He said, now, this I say therefore and I testify in the Lord. This is coming from the Lord. That henceforth you walk not as other Gentiles walk. 
Well, how did they walk? In the vanity of their minds, empty-minded. And they, had, and they had their understanding darkened. They were alienated from the life of God in verse 18. And that was through the ignorance of, of that was in them because of their blindness or the hardness of their hearts. That's what he's talking about. Who being in past feeling have given themselves over. And that's life. He's talking about Romans 1 here. Okay. To work all uncleanness with greediness. He says, but ye have not learned Christ. So if so be you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Truth's in Jesus. Therefore, there that you put off the old concerning the former conversation, your manner of living, your lifestyle, the old man, the old person, the old self, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Recommit your spirit and your mind to Christ, and you've got to do it through the word of God and sanctification. And then in verse 24, he says, and now put on the new man, which is after Christ is created in righteousness and true holiness. Because you see, when you got saved, you got some clothing. You got some spiritual clothing when you got saved. You got clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And now you stand right before God as if you've never sinned. You've been made righteous. And God has clothed us in righteousness and also what? In holiness. So Paul says if you want to have some spiritual success, you've got to put the right clothes on. And that's the spiritual clothes, that of righteousness in holiness. Cast off this other stuff. Renew your mind in the Lord. And you go back and you see where Paul reminds some of them, and he mentions even some of those sins, sins in Romans 1. Such were some of you. Because let me give you another mistruth that's going around. That those that live in that lifestyle and commit that lifestyle today, that that's the unpardonable sin. That is not the unpardonable sin. Paul said, such were some of you, but now you have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. You can be saved in that lifestyle and out of it. But as long as you want to live that way and do that and be that and so forth, God says, no problem, have at it. He turned them over and gave them over to do what they wanted to do. After he gave them the truth, they rejected that truth goodness then they replaced God with this other stuff and this is exactly what America has done and I'm afraid they did it on Sunday my 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 that's why you and I we got to do what Paul says here in the word of God amen now next week he's going to get into more putting off Wherefore, because now you're created in the righteousness and holiness of God, and you've put on the new man, put away lying, speaking every man the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. And he goes on and on. And we'll take a look at that, Lord willing, next week if we're still here and haven't been raptured out. Amen. Amen. Please pray for our country. They're not letting us preach the truth anymore and share the gospel. And it's just, it's, it's unbelievable. Well, we're not living in a free America anymore, church. And we are losing our freedoms faster than you can think. We're losing our First Amendment rights. This is the America we're living in today, and the President of the United States has declared a holiday of Easter, and we will celebrate it in promotion of that and fly the colors of that. And that's this Ishtash God, whatever, the pagan, pagan god of the ba old Babylonian pagan deities, and that's what she was. And she dressed half man and half male. 
and said, we'll do, I'll do what I'll be what I want this day, I'll be what I want that day. And the men used to take and do things to their body, I'm not going to sit here and tell you about it, and parade around in their, in their pagan worship to her, trying to look like women. And the women would do things to their body and dress like men and parade around to be like men. And folks, that's exactly what's happening in America today. And our country just now has recognized that as a national holiday and rejected Easter. Don't tell me we're not in trouble, church. And you need to pay for Pastor Jack Hibbs out there in California. He's under the, the gun of, the, of everybody's after him. For taking a stand for Christ. And uh, wow. Those guys, I'm with, I'm with them. I, I, I envy them because, you know, he's pastor of a church of 10,000. He's got a $20 million budget. You know, I pastor 40 and got a $1,000 budget. And so, you know, I don't have 20 lawyers in my church <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. So these guys can get a little more braver because <laughs> they got some money in back and get lawyers with them. And bless God. But hey, let's walk in the newness of life. Let's walk in the purity of life in our Christian life, in our walk, and walk worthy of what God has called us to and given to us. He's worthy of it, and he's worth it. Amen. So pray for our country. Pray for our leadership, church. It, it's serious stuff, and we're in trouble. And if God does write Ichabod over America, we're doomed for judgment, big time. It could be financial judgment, economic judgment. Who knows what it could be? I just pray and hope I'm not here when it happens. I'm looking forward to the rapture and getting out of here. But it doesn't mean we might not have to go through some of it. Only the goodness and the grace and the patience of God. And some would say, man, why doesn't the Lord deal with them in Washington? Why doesn't he do something and smite them, take them out? You know Why? Because God's long-suffering and patient, and he's not willing that any should perish, even the administration in the White House, but that they all come to repentance. And Jesus said, I would that men everywhere be saved.
Don't miss the phrase. Everybody with me? Verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Paul's giving us, uh, we got this, what he's sharing with them. It is a direct revelation from God. I'm sorry for all these bulls out here that don't believe this. Don't believe in the rapture of the church and everything that's going to take place. And so that it's all spiritual. And, and again, like that 2,000 years. Now, I feel sorry for you. I'm sorry that you don't have no blessed hope. And the reason why they don't have any hope because they haven't believed. That, Paul made that very clear, church. He said, if we believe. That's where it all starts. You've got to have a starting point. And you're going to have this open heart. And this is certainty from the Lord. What is by the word of the Lord? Direct revelation. Paul's teaching on the rapture was not his own speculation, but direct revelation from God. That's why I believe in the rapture, because it's direct revelation from God. Matter of fact, there's stuff going on here this week and so forth, folks. And, and it's, it's true. Listen to me. We're not in the tribulation right now. You understand that? We're not in the first part of it. We're not in the middle of it. We're not in the end of it. You understand that? We're not in the battle of Gog and Magog of Ezekiel 38 and 39 of that battle. We're not in that battle, okay? You understand that? That battle's not going to take place. We're not in the trib right now because I'm still here. All that takes place when the church is raptured out. Then the Antichrist is revealed. Then there's a peace covenant treaty signed between Israel and the ten, Air, and the ten confederation of the Arab nations will sign that peace treaty. And then it'll go along for a while. Gog and Magog then will attack Russia, including Syria and Iran. And that's when the Antichrist is going to defend Israel and take care of all that. And they're going to just, oh man, he is it. He is the Messiah. Look what he's done. Then all of a sudden he's going to walk into the temple. He's going to desecrate the temple because they're going to build it and it hadn't been built yet. That's why we're not there yet, you see. He's going to desecrate the temple, the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet in Daniel 9, 27. You see, so that's why I know we're not there yet because the church is still here. So don't worry about all this that's going on. It's got to happen. It's part of God's plan. But it's not the battle of Gog and Magog. It's not the tribulation. The Antichrist is not here, and the church hasn't got raptured out yet. What we got to do is get the blessed hope out. We've got to get the message out. I understand today that right now they're, they're calling up some of the reserves in Israel, the IDF or something like that, that are reservists. You know, because in Israel it's mandatory when you grow up as a kid and you turn a young adult, whatever it is, you serve two years in the military. Everybody, women, everybody. And they've called it up today. One of the young ladies was called up. Her and her husband both are in the, in the reserve, and they've been called up. And she's a Messianic Jew. And she said, we realize what God has called us up for today. She said, there's about a thousand of us in the IDF of, this, uh, of that that are Messianic Jews. And God has raised us up for this hour of this time to be a light among the Jewish, our own people. Hallelujah. They're going to share that blessed hope.